This past Friday was the feast of Our Lady of Czestochowa. She was named by King Casimir of Poland in 1656 as the Queen of Poland, and Pope Pius XI gave her a feast day under the same title. My material for this portion of the sermon here comes mostly from Joan Carroll Cruz and her book, The Miraculous Images of Our Lady. Tradition tells us that the image of Our Lady of Czestochowa was actually painted by St. Luke the Apostle. This feast day gives us a chance to tie several things together. So there are actually kind of three parts to this sermon. After the painting was created by St. Luke, it remained in Jerusalem until it was found by St. Helen around the year 326, when she was there in her search for the true cross. She brought the painting to Constantinople, where her son, the Emperor Constantine, built a special church to house it. On one occasion, centuries later, the image alone defended the city from the Saracens. When the Muslims were in position to attack Constantinople, the image was taken in procession around the walls of the city. And with that, and only that, the Muslims fled. The image remained in Constantinople until almost the year 1000, when it found its way to Russia, the part of Russia which later became Poland. While it was there, the city came under attack, and the painting was struck by an enemy's arrow. There's a scar below the scars on the cheek that we're all familiar with, the two, scar, the two long scars, which we'll talk about in a moment. There's another scar lower down on her neck. And despite efforts to repair these, these scars, they have remained. Well, seeing in this event that the image of Mary was in danger where it was, St. Ladislaw decided that he should move it to a safer location in another city. On the way, the painting had to pass through the town of Czestochowa. There, the wagon carrying it stopped for the night, and the picture was placed for the night in the Church of the Assumption on the hill of Jasnagora. On the morning of August 26th, 1382, when the time came for St. Ladislaw and the image to continue their journey, the horses who had been hitched to the wagon refused to move. St. Ladislaw saw right away in this the hand of God, for the horses had behaved just fine up to that point in the trip, and it was not a natural thing for them to behave this way. So the saint ordered that the image be replaced in the church at Jasnagora and remain there, and that a monastery be founded there for monks to protect and honor the image. So the Pauline fathers have guarded the image of the mon in the monastery at Jasnagora for over 600 years now. But there have been many trials and tests and many miracles in that time. In 1430, a band of heretics was pillaging the monastery. They loaded the image onto a cart to haul it away. But again, the horses would not move. Different horses this time. It was 50 years later. So the Hussite heretics smashed the picture. One of the soldiers drew his sword and began hacking at the pieces. But before his third stroke could fall, he himself was struck to the ground with a pain that very soon took his life. The two slash marks we see on Our Lady's cheek in the image are from this event. In 1655, a Protestant army of 12,000 men came against the monastery, which was manned with only 300 monks and some guards. The Protestants were totally and disgracefully defeated. Odds of 40 to 1 are nothing for the mother of God. A year later when King, is when King Casimir named Our Lady of Czestochowa as the Queen of Poland. In 1920, the Russian armies approached the city of Warsaw. On the Feast of Our Lady of Snows, the people of Poland, of course, fled to Mary for protection. Her image appeared in the sky over the city of Warsaw, and the Russians, like the Saracens centuries earlier, withdrew, 
without even attacking. The people of Poland are still very dedicated, of course, to Our Lady of Czestochowa and are rightly blessed and rewarded for their devotion. So there's just a little bit about that famous image that we've all seen. Her feast day was just this past Friday, the anniversary of that first time that the horses wouldn't move and Mary decided that she wanted to stay in Czestochowa. How good it is to be Catholic. We know that we can rely on the intercession and the protection of the saints. And more than this, we even have sacred images and sacramentals with which to implore and draw down grace from God. Really quickly, to remember what sacramentals are. Sacraments, we know, are outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace. We better know that. There are three elements to that definition. Outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. A sacramental is an outward sign instituted by the church to give grace. Things like medals, blessings, holy cards, images, holy water. Sacramentals have power. As our Lord today used spit to cure the man. If faith were all that was necessary, why would our Lord use things like spit, on other occasions mud? The material world is there to help us get to heaven. And through the power of the church, we can sanctify these material things as aids to bringing us grace and protection of Almighty God. That's how the universe works. Now, just to be clear again, against our Protestant brethren, we do not worship images any more than we worship saints. We ask the saints for their intercession in prayer, asking them to get help for us from God. We understand that it's all God's power, and we honor the images as representing those saints, not for the sake of honoring the image itself, the honor given to the image is the honor given to the saint. Just as when one honors the flag of his country, he is not honoring a piece of colored cloth, but he's honoring the country for which it stands. And turning from that then back to the Blessed Mother, in honor of this recent feast of hers, I thought I would take a moment to discuss perhaps the most powerful sacramental in the church her Holy Rosary. Now here again we will take some flack from our separated brethren. For Matthew 6, 7 tells us, When you are praying, speak not much as the heathens do, for they think that in their much speaking they may be heard. Our Protestant friends, of course, think that we are violating this scripture passage when we repeat the Hail Mary over and over and over again in the Rosary. But this is not true. We understand that by simply repeating words, even words like this in the rosary, we will not get what we're praying for. But we use the words of the rosary to honor Mary and her son, and they also help us focus our prayers and to pray with more devotion. It is not the words themselves that bring the blessing, but the devotion and the faith attached to those words. Faith without works is dead. So it's just fine to use these formulated prayers. St. Padre Pio used to refer to his rosary beads as his weapon. Indeed, it is a powerful thing. It takes more power, for instance, to move a soul from the state of mortal sin to the state of grace than it took to create the entire universe. And yet, St. Louis de Montfort shows us over and over again that, quote, great sinners, both men and women, have been converted after 20, 30, 40 years of sin and unspeakable vice because they persevered in saying the Holy Rosary. Many of my comments that follow are taken from St. Louis de Montfort. But be clear, 
God gives us so many very simple ways to ensure our salvation. Something so simple as being devoted to the rosary. No matter what our problems, no matter how confusing or difficult things seem, if we devote ourselves to the rosary, Mary will take care of the rest. St. Louis de Montfort goes on to assure us that, quote, if you practice this devotion and help to spread it, you will learn more from the rosary than from any spiritual book and have the happiness of being rewarded by Our Lady according to the promises she made to St. Dominic. Mary promised her special protection and very great graces to those who say the rosary. The rosary, Mary said, shall be a very powerful armor against hell. It shall destroy vice, deliver from sin, and shall dispel heresy. It shall obtain for souls the most abundant divine mercies. Think how simple this is. What a great blessing to be raised with a daily rosary. Those who will recite my rosary piously, considering its mysteries, shall not be overwhelmed by misfortune, nor die a bad death. The sinner shall be converted, and the just shall grow in grace and become worthy of eternal life. Those who will recite my rosary, Mary said, shall find during their life and at their death the light of God, the fullness of his grace, and shall share in the merits of the blessed. It's a guarantee of heaven. The true children of my rosary, Mary said, shall enjoy great glory in heaven. What you ask through my rosary, she said, you shall obtain. Devotion to my rosary is a special sign of predestination. The rosary teaches us the virtues of our Lord and his Holy Mother and leads us in mental prayer, says St. Louis de Montfort. Blessed Alain de la Roche tells us this about the power of the rosary. He says, by it, sinners are forgiven, thirsty souls are refreshed, those who are chained have their bonds broken, the sad find happiness, those who are tempted find peace, the poor find help, pride is overcome, and the suffering in, pur in purgatory have their pains eased. What a powerful, powerful tool. Heaven is yours, guaranteed if you will take this devotion seriously. So how do we take the rosary seriously? How do you say the rosary such that your salvation is guaranteed? Well, for one thing, we have to understand this power. St. Louis de Montfort tells us that it is not so much the length of the prayer, but the devotion or the attention with which one says the prayer. One Hail Mary said well is worth more than 15 decades said badly. Two things to make sure that we're saying the rosary well. It's very simple. A purpose of amendment and pay attention. Remember, it's not so much the words, but the devotion that makes it a good prayer. Two things, purpose of amendment and pay attention. So the purpose of amendment. See, grace builds on nature. You can't expect saying the rosary to solve all your problems if you will not take the steps to solve your problems. Remember the old expression, right? Work as if everything depends on you, but pray as if everything depends on God. See, the guy who prays his rosary every day saying, I wish I could get over this drinking problem, but he won't quit hanging out in bars is not really serious about quitting. How is Mary going to help him if he won't give her the opportunity? Now, if he's trying to avoid those places, well, that's different. Mary certainly will help him. So we have to do our part. If we do and we say the rosary, then we cannot fail. Thus, even sinners, and indeed especially sinners, can say the rosary most profitably. No matter what the sin, no matter how long it has gone on, no matter how deep it goes or how far from God, if one will have a purpose of amendment, the desire and intention to sin no more, the rosary will save him. 
And the second thing we need to do to make sure that we're saying a rosary well is to pay attention, to say the prayers as they were meant to be said. Pay attention. That's why those prayers are there. That's why we name the mysteries, so that we can have something to pay attention to. That's how we're supposed to use these prayers. What, for example, would become of the greatest knight in the world if he took the best sword that was ever made into battle, but he kept it in its scabbard and held it by the wrong end and used it as a club? Wouldn't be very useful, would it? So we need to pay attention during the rosary. That's how to use these prayers. Here's an example. We'll go through this right now. You can use your imagination. You can shut your eyes if you want and think about this. Imagine your favorite car or what's hanging in your closet or the dinner you're looking forward to tonight. See, this is the power of the imagination. You can make these things really present. Now change that image to the angel Gabriel standing before the Blessed Mother. You can picture it, can't you? Because you chose to. That's the gift of the imagination. It's not just there to be a nuisance when you're trying to do something serious. You're in control of this gift. See, each time I said something, you had a different image in your mind. It's why God gave us an imagination. We need to use it. Of course, it can be a lot of fun. And certainly, if we use it in prayer, it can be very pleasing, very peaceful. Meditating on the prayers we're saying. Place yourself at the time and the place of the mystery you are praying. Bethlehem. You know what it is to be cold. You know what the night looks like. A few of you probably even know what snow looks like. We're Calvary. We know dust, humidity, blood, sweat. We can think about these things. Pentecost, there's a lot to use your imagination on, or the assumption. And we say the words of the Annunciation 53 times in the Hail Marys of each rosary. Think of that particular event, the greatest event in human history. And think about why those things are going on, what God has done for us. And the two and a half minutes that it takes you to say one decade is not nearly enough, no matter how fast your mind works. This is what it means to meditate on the rosary. It's very, very simple. We've all done it. Some of you are doing it just now. See, God wants all men to be saved, but no man is saved without prayer. Therefore, it must be possible for all men to pray. And this is what it means to pray the rosary. Have a purpose of amendment. Pay attention and simply say a rosary each day. And we cannot fail. Our salvation is guaranteed because we are in the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.